Okay, so now on to example one. So example one, um, basically just saying combine the following functions and then determine the domain. So we can see here we have four functions. We have f of x, which is x minus three, g of x, I'm not gonna say them because you can read them, h of x and j of x. And the important thing here is defining the domain because we can apply the operations. I mean, basically I think most of you feel all right. I did kind of select a couple problems that will have some fun uh, with simplifying them. But the main important thing is identifying the domain. So what I want to do here first is let's just look at the domain of each of these functions just on their own because again whenever we apply the operations we have to take with them the domain of each of the functions so it doesn't really matter whatever we're doing here and however our simplified result remains we have to make sure that we also include uh, the domain restriction of the of the original functions that we're applying the operations for. So let's go ahead and just look at you know this first one f of x x minus three. Well, you know that's a line, so we know that the line is you know there there are no restrictions on that. So the domain here is going to be from oh let me zoom in here. Domain the the domain here is going to be from negative infinity to infinity. Uh, for g of x, uh, this is a quadratic function. Again, that's you know just going to be a parabola where that domain is not restricted as well. We can plug in any values for x that we want to, um, and that graph is going to keep on expanding left and right. So that's from negative infinity to infinity. The next one here, we have the square root function, and we know that the square root function is um, undefined for negative values. We can't take the square root of a negative uh, value. So this uh, function is has a restricted domain from zero. To infinity basically meaning including the number zero any other values that are larger and then the last example is a rational uh, expression j of x and we know that a rational function is undefined for values that make the denominator equal to zero so just to go ahead and set this equal to zero and you can see that if i subtract one divided by two when x is equal to negative one half, my function is is undefined. So therefore, the domain restriction here is going to be uh, negative infinity to negative. Let me zoom back in, I guess, to negative one half, and then union negative one half to infinity. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're just going to apply the operations. We're just going to say you know f of x plus g of x. Now remember. You know, what we looked in those last notes, f plus g of x basically just means taking the function f of x, and let me, let's use blue here. Basically just means taking the function f of x and then adding it to the function g of x. Well, that's exactly what this is saying. So now all I got to do is um, replace f of x with its, with its function, which in this case is just going to be x minus 3. Now, you could use parentheses. You know, a lot of times if I'm replacing f of x with this function, you could say x minus 3 plus g of x, which is x squared minus 4x plus 3, okay? But when, since we're adding, the parentheses don't really, um, aren't really required because they're not really helping us with the grouping because our end result is, again, to combine these. So I'm just going to erase these uh, parentheses here. Didn't mean to erase that x. Let's put that back. Okay, and now I can just group like terms. Again, for them to be grouped like terms, they have to have the same base as well as the same power, um, or, and obviously numbers we're gonna combine. So by doing that, I have x squared is all by itself. x plus negative four x, you could rearrange them if you want to, but I think that's for um, earlier videos. So we have x minus four x is going to be negative three x. And then I have negative three plus three is going to be zero, which you could write, but you don't need to. Um, we can just leave that off. So therefore, I have this uh, quadratic as my function. So I'll just write that notation back there. And now let's go and look at the domain. Well, the domain of I added two functions that were unrestricted, right? And then, you know, in combining them, I'm still having another quadratic that's unrestricted. So my domain in this case is just going to be from negative infinity to infinity. I didn't add any other, you know, restrictions um, by adding these two functions. All right, let's move over to the next one, which is just going to be now subtracting. Now here, subtracting is where really the parentheses are going to um, be most important. So if I'm using the parentheses, uh, let's use, you know, blue here, I have this x minus 3. Oh, let me just write the notation one last time. So this is really saying, you know, f of x minus g of x, okay? So if I replace this with parentheses, you know, x minus 3 minus 
x squared minus 4x plus 3. Okay? And it's important because if you don't put parentheses, if you erase this parenthesis right here, and you don't use your parentheses, that's just saying minus x. It's not saying minus the whole expression. That's why the parentheses is so important. Now, as far as the parentheses for the x minus 3, that's not really as important because they're, um, you're taking this whole quantity and you're subtracting all of that. And I like to get rid of the parentheses anyways, and the way that I get rid of the parentheses is just by applying distributive property with that negative because you're subtracting this whole quantity. So you can get rid of the parentheses there, and then by distributing this, I get a negative x squared. Negative times negative is a positive. Negative times 3 is going to be a negative 3. And now I have this expression that now I can go ahead and group my like terms. So I have a negative x squared. Let's see, I have x plus 4x. That's going to be plus 5x. And then negative 3 minus 3. So you owe me $3. You borrow three more dollars. You now owe me $6. So that is going to be our f minus g of x. Okay. Um, again, our domain here is you can see that this produces a quadratic. Again, my operations were my two functions um, that were unrestricted. So therefore, my new domain is not going to have any restrictions as well. All right, let's get on to some multiplying. So I'm just going to do all the products with f and g here. So um, multiplying. That is, again, just going to be taking the function f of x times g of x. I don't know why I'm using double parentheses here. So by replacing that in, now again, here's parentheses again would come in helpful here. That's really going to be x minus 3 times x squared minus 4x. I hate when it does that with my 4s. x minus 4x, and what was it? Plus, what was that function? Plus 3? Plus 3. Okay, now you can apply, you can multiply this by distributive property if you like. Um, I prefer when multiplying anything larger than binomials, I like to use what I call the box method. And, geez, let's see if I can get this right here. So when doing the box method, basically all you're doing is when you're multiplying, you're, you're basically finding the area of, you know, two quantities. So what I can do here is I can represent x minus 3 as like the side length of a rectangle. No. So I can represent x minus 3 as the side length of this rectangle, and then x squared minus 4x plus 3 as the other side length. And then when I multiply them, I'm basically finding the area of this rectangle. And it's just a nice way. You don't need to do this. I mean, for this problem, you could probably do this rather quickly with uh, just using a distributive property. Um, I only like using the box method just because uh, we are going to be using this later in this course. And I think for some students, it's just kind of helpful to keep things organized, you know, and then also you can kind of check your work. So all we're going to do now is I have all these rectangles within this rectangle that I'm just going to find the area, just going to do length times width. So x times x squared is going to be x cubed. x times negative 4x is negative 4x squared. x times 3 is going to be a 3x. x squared times negative 3 is a negative 3x squared. Negative 3 times negative 4x is going to be a positive 12x. And then negative 3 times 3 is going to be a negative 9. And the only thing that's nice, you know, that's best about this is as long as you have them in standard form, you can see that your like terms are on the diagonal. So I just like that method just kind of for its simplicity as well as the organization. So now I'm going to go ahead and write this out as x cubed. Now I can combine these as negative 3x squared minus 4x squared, which is going to be a negative 7x squared. 12x plus 3x is going to be a positive 15x, and then minus 9. Okay, So that is going to be your, your product of these two. And then, and oh, I forgot, our domain. Well, again, we just took two functions, and our functions do not bring in any domain restrictions. So therefore, there's nothing else. You can see this is just going to produce a polynomial. So our, my domain is going to be from negative infinity to infinity. All right, now, in this last example here, I have f divided by g of x, which is basically, again, saying f of x you know, divided by g of x. But remember, g of x cannot equal 0. So by doing division, I'm actually now bringing in a new constraint saying what the value of my function in my denominator now cannot be 0. So by rewriting this here, I'm going to have x minus 3 divided by you know, x squared minus 4x plus 3. 
So now I need to determine, all right, well, what values then make this zero? Because those are, even though this function is a continuous function, you know, continuous qu quadratic, um, since the division, it can't equal zero. So now I got to set up an equation and go ahead and figure out, well, when is, what values is this going to be equal to zero? And now I can just do some factoring, you know, what two numbers multiply to give you three, but add to give you negative four. So I can say, well, that's going to be x minus 3 times x minus 1. Because negative 3 times negative 1 is 3. And then when you multiply them both by the x's, you get negative 4x. And x times x is x squared. Now I can apply the zero product property. I can say when x equals 3, uh, let's just go through it. So now I can say x minus 3 is equal to 0 or x minus 1 is equal to 0. For what values both of those are going to make that zero, and if one of those products is zero, then or one of those expressions is going to equal to zero, then their product will equal to zero. So therefore, when x equals three, or when x equals one, my denominator is going to equal zero. So therefore, now my domain is restricted. Its domain is restricted for all values except for I'm sorry, it is unrestricted for all values except for three and one because those are the values that make the denominator equal to zero. So my domain in this case is going to be from negative infinity to 1, union between 1 and 3, union from 1 to infinity. Okay, and again, this is like the same thing as me saying, you know, the domain is all real numbers such that x cannot equal 3 and x cannot equal 1. Okay, that's just another way to write it, but this is our interval notation, which we're going to be uh, most familiar with. All right, so that was the kind of basic um, one, just so you guys can see. Now let's kind of get into some examples where we're just going to have a little fun, uh, a little fun with some mathematical operations and kind of see, you know, how this is going to uh, differentiate, you know, between these. So here I have g of x divided by f of x. I'm not going to rewrite this again. I'm just going to go into what exactly those functions are. So in this case here, uh, so I have g of x divided by f of x. Oh, that's the switch, actually. Did I not do those? Oh, okay, let's swap those out. Never mind. That's uh, getting into my next round. Sorry, I got two more examples to go through. Um, g divided by f. So that's going to be basically the exact same thing. x squared. Oh, one thing I did want to mention to you. I forgot to simplify this, didn't I? Crap. I got to go through and simplify that. All right. Uh, all right. Let's come back to that. Sorry. I forgot. I totally forgot I made this example. Um, so if I want to simplify this, I can actually simplify this a little bit further. If you remember, we talked about like um, restrictions, you know, and like holes and discontinuities. If I rewrite this in my factored form, which I'll have to put over here, and I apologize. So I just kind of got thinking into one thing and then I totally forgot about this. If I rewrite this times x minus 1, then you can see the x minus 3s are going to divide out. So my final simplified answer is actually going to be, I'll write up here, 1 over x minus 1, where x cannot equal 3 and 1. So we got to make sure we still bring in those restrictions that it can't equal 3 and it can't equal 1, but we can rewrite our simplified version just like that. Uh, sorry about that. I totally kind of forgot about that until I went over to this expression. I was like, oh, great. Like, let's just, you know, redo this. Well, here I have x squared minus 4x plus 3 divided by x minus 3. And the same thing can be applied. Since this can be factored here, you know, this becomes x minus 3 times x minus 1 divided by x minus 3. Now, again, remember, this now tells us that our domain restriction is x cannot equal 3, right? So I can go ahead and write the domain right now. I can just kind of stop and say, all right, the domain is going to be, I'll write it down here. Domain is going to be all values except for 3. So in not interval notation, I'd say from negative infinity to 3, union 3 to infinity. However, I can algebraically simplify this a little bit further, and I can just rewrite this as, you know, x minus 1. So I could say g of f times x 
or of f, sorry, is going to equal to x minus 1. However, since that rational expression is no longer like visible, I can just add you know, the exception and saying, hey, just make sure that x cannot equal 3, OK? Because that's exactly where that came from. Um, now, this next example, f plus j. OK, now I am getting into the new function. So now I'm going to start dealing with some different functions here that are not f and g, which was you know, rather basic. But you know, it's a good thing to kind of go back and review some of that stuff. So now we're going to do you know, different functions, all right? And in this case, I'm just going to write the functions, what they are, and then we'll see if we can algebraically you know, apply any operations to them. All right, so f plus j of x. So f of x is going to be x minus 3. And I'm just going to put them in parentheses for right now, and then we can get rid of the parentheses as we want. And then j of x is going to be 2 over 2x plus 1. Okay, now can we combine these at all? Is there something else that we can, you know, do? And yeah, we can. We we can actually get common denominators and then go ahead and combine them. Now I will say though, for the purpose of this, if we just want to find the domain, we can kind of like stop here and say, all right, well, why don't I just figure out what the domain is? And you can see that this is not bringing in any domain restrictions. This is bringing in a domain restriction, so that's going to be the only restriction. So. If you were just to take a look at this graph, you'd see this graph, just by adding these two functions, one that does not have a restricted domain, one that does, the restricted domain is going to still be the only restriction that we have of our, you know, of our addition. So the domain of this function is just going to be um, the domain of j of x, which was negative infinity to negative one half union negative one half to infinity. Now, typically, I don't really, you know, we can have a little fun with this. I guess we can, you know, determine, let's get common denominators and, and see what we could do here. So we could think of that as over 1. So if I wanted to get common denominators, let's zoom in one more time. No, zoom in, not zoom out. So to get common denominators here, I could multiply by 2x plus 1 on the top and the bottom. 2x plus 1. All right, now I'm going to do a little math in my head because I wasn't really planning on doing this. So if I'm going to multiply these, again, you could use box method. You could use distributed property. Let's say 2x times x is going to be 2x squared. 2x times 3 is a negative 6x. Uh, 1 times x is going to be a positive x. And then 1 times negative 3 is a negative 3. And that's going to be all over 2x plus 1. And that's going to be plus 2 over 2x plus 1. So now I can just combine my like terms. Since they have the same denominator, I can just combine the numerators. And I can only combine like terms here. So I can combine the x's and I can combine the numbers. And then the denominator obviously just remains the same. So this becomes 2x squared uh, minus 5x minus 1 all over 2x plus 1. And again, if we were going to look at this domain, again, like of this rational function, we would still see that the domain that we originally had before we even simplified this was exactly the same. So it really kind of depends on the question if you need to simplify this a little bit further or if it's a multiple choice, you know, whatever else. But there's at least an example of, you know, working through some adding rational expressions, which we get into more in depth uh, later in the course. So I'm not too worried about it if you're like, whoa, uh, I'm kind of confused with that. So we'll get to it. Don't worry. Uh, the next one is g minus h. So g of x is going back to our function here. So that's going to be uh, x squared minus 4x plus 3. And now in this case, I am subtracting my h of x function, which is 3 squared of x. Now this one's a little bit different because I'm not gonna really going to want to be subtracting. These are not like terms. So there's really nothing else that I can do here um, as far as combining. It's like, you know, subtracting a y. You can't subtract, like they're not like terms. So there's really nothing mathematically uh, in this case that I can do this function. So I'm basically, I have my function completed. Now I just need to go ahead and determine my domain. So again, just for time purposes, I'm not going to be able to, I'm just kind of skimming through writing the correct notation as much as possible. But um, so that's minus, isn't it? Oh, that's plus 3. And then minus 3 squared of x. Okay, but as far as the domain goes, the domain is our h of x function is restricted from 0 to infinity. And my g of x function is not, does not have any restrictions, so therefore my domain is just going to be the original restriction of h of x, which is h, which is 0 to infinity. All right, now we can go ahead and multiply h times g of x. 
Um, again, that's going to be kind of still something. Oh, that was the one I was having a little fun with. So this one we could have a little fun because you can multiply when they're not like terms. Um, but adding and subtracting gets a little more difficult. So let's actually write it to the left, to the right here. So that's going to be 3 square root of x times x squared minus 4x plus 3. Now, typically in this case, again, um, we don't. We can simplify this further, or at least I'll show you what to do, um, how it's simplified, just to have a little fun. But if we were just looking for, you know, again, what is like the domain going to be, then obviously we can see that the only restriction doesn't matter if it's at, subtracting like the last example or multiplying like in this example. My domain is just going to be my restriction of my h of x function because g of x does not have a restriction of infinity to zero. Now, the whole purpose of this, you know, kind of lesson is just to practice some algebraic techniques, which we will get into, you know, later, but just to also kind of remember some things. So here, when we're multiplying, remember, you know, a couple of rules with multiplying. First of all, I can rewrite any rational, any root as a rational power. So I could rewrite this as three X to the one half, right? And if there's not a, let's see, that'd be X to the um, 2 minus 4x to the first power plus 3. You could write x to the 0 if you want to, but we don't really need to. Then also remember that when you're multiplying, uh, when you're multiplying exponents, you add the powers. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm going to be doing, you know, I need to add 1 half plus 2. You could rewrite 2 as 4 halves, so therefore you'd see that's equal to 5 halves. Then I'd also, when I multiply 1 half times 1, um, you can rewrite 1 as 2 over 2, so therefore you can see that is 3 halves. So by multiplying this, I can rewrite this as uh, 3 to x to the 1 half times x squared is going to be 3x to the 5 halves minus 4x to the 3 halves. Oops, I'm sorry, that's minus 12, isn't it? Got to make sure you multiply the numbers 3 times negative 4. So that's going to be 12 times x to the 3 halves. And then here, and just 3 times 3 is going to be 9x to the 1 half. Okay? And then also just uh, remember that radical, the way that I did that is, remember if you have, you know, ax to the b, then you can rewrite that as x to the b over a. So now if I want to rewrite this as radicals, just to have a little fun, you can see that this is going to be 3 times the square root of x to the fifth, minus 12 times the square root of x to the third, plus 9 times the square root of x. So just a little, just a little, kind of a little extra um, for you. It's not really something that we get big into um, in this class, but, you know, just to kind of prepare you guys for, you know, some more complicated functions that you might have in your own class um, or you might see in future math classes as well. All right, so now let's get on to the next one. Here I'm going to be multiplying g times j. Um, so in this case, I have x squared minus 4x plus 3 and I'm going to be multiplying that times j which is going to be the 2 times 2x plus 1. Okay, um, so now when I go ahead and multiply these, you, know, you can just multiply straight across. Remember you need to multiply, or, well, you could distribute that 2 in here. I want to see if that's going to be factorable, which it's not. So we can just leave that, you know, as is. Sometimes you want to, like, factor this to see if, like, this would divide out, but it doesn't. So I'm just going to distribute that 2 all the way across. And therefore, I get 2x squared minus 8x plus 6. This is non-factorable with 2x plus 1 because you can see here in this case, um, you know, the 2 would not... Uh, does not produce that uh, that factor and therefore that's just going to be all over 2x plus 1 and then again you can see my domain restriction is the remain is um, is taken over here so that's going to be negative infinity to negative 1 half union negative 1 half to infinity all right uh, moving on to f divided by j mm, I like this one so in this case we have f which is x minus 3 divided by j, which is 2 divided by 2x plus 1. 
Okay, so when we're looking into the division, there's a couple things that are going on here. We have two different denominators here, right? Just looking at this from this case, we have two different denominators. We know that um, our denom our we know that 2x plus 1 cannot equal 0, right? So we know that's going to be a part of our domain. But then also we have this example. So we basically have two restrictions here that we're going to want to write. Our first one is we know that 2x plus 1 you know, cannot equal 0. But then also 2 over 2x plus 1 cannot equal 0, right? I mean, that's basically what we have here. And fortunately, though, when we can solve for this one, we already are aware of that domain restriction. And obviously, when we solve this one, you multiply by the 2x plus 1 on both sides to get rid of the fraction. Um, you have 2 cannot equal 0, which is obviously you know, undefined, doesn't make sense. So therefore, we can see that the only restriction here is going to be the 2x plus 1 um, cannot equal 0. Now, I can simplify this. and. Um, if I want to simplify this, so again, I know my domain is going to be what was brought, you know, in with it of the j of x, but we can simplify this to kind of get a, you know, kind of clear idea of what this would look like. And to do that, we can just multiply by the reciprocal of my denominator. So I can just multiply by 2x plus 1 over 2 on the top and the bottom. Okay, and when multiplying that here, you got to make sure that these are going to divide out to 1, right? So those divide all out to 1. And then I basically have x minus 3 over 1 times 2x plus 1 over 2. Now I'm going to put parentheses in here because, again, i got to remind myself, okay, make sure you apply you know, the distributed property here. So when doing that, I would get 2x squared. Um, let's just do this for a 2x squared plus x minus 6x minus 3 all over 2, which I'm just going to write here over to the side, another equal sign. Uh, let's see, those can combine into, I don't really like going horizontal, but I'm kind of running out of space, so I'm going to have to deal with I need to. So therefore, that becomes 2x squared minus 5x minus 3 all over 2. And again, you can see here, oh, well, there's no domain restrictions. But again, remember that domain restriction has to come with our previous function. So our domain is restricted here, and that's going to be it cannot equal negative 1 half. Uh, 1 half. And again, since that is not evident here, we could also just kind of, we could also write x cannot equal negative 1 half. So when we simplify that and it's not evident that x cannot equal negative 1 half, we might want to remind, uh, you know, the viewer of that case. All right, let's uh, wrap up here the last two examples. This is my longest example, and I do apologize for it. It is kind of uh, pretty long. So in this case, we're going to do g divided by h. Man, I really liked doing the... Uh, <laughs> the g function. So I have x squared minus 4x plus 3 and divided by 3 square root of x. Okay, so there's really nothing else I can do. I mean, we could try dividing and doing some crazy stuff, but again, they're not like terms, so it's not really going to get you very far. Um, so now we can just look at my domain restrictions. I know that 3 cannot equal 0, so therefore now 0 is undefined. But remember that original domain restriction of h was x is greater than or equal to 0. So if the only new restriction of this now being a fraction is that x cannot equal 0, well, now my domain, instead of it being from 0 to infinity, right, because that's the domain restriction of my h of x, but now h of x is in the denominator. So 0 cannot be included. So now we're going to use parentheses to say that now 0 is not included, and my domain is from 0 to infinity. All right, the next one is just h of x times h of x. Um, so basically, all this is saying is you're just multiplying the same function by itself. So 3 squared of x times 3 squared of x. Now, again, we know that the domain is from 0 to infinity. Now, when I multiply this, I'm going to get 9 square root of x squared. Well, the square root of x squared is just going to be x, so we have 9x. And so therefore, that's going to be my function. But remember, if you look at this, you say, oh, that's a line. The domain is unrestricted. Well, or the domain is not restricted. But again, yes, the domain is restricted because we have of our two functions here of square root of x. So my domain in this case 
is again going to be from zero to infinity. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. That is your basic operations of your functions, as well as how to you know kind of uh, write them out and identify the domain. Now we'll get into some smaller, shorter examples here, uh, moving on with the rest of the chapter.